Good morning. Welcome to the study of the Word of God with Spring Valley Bible Church. I'll be your pastor today. My name is Bill McMillan, and uh, we'll begin in just a moment. We all online, everything did there, Julie? All right. Technical department says we are a go. Okay. Let's start with the word of, uh, with a word of prayer because nothing we can say or do on our own is worthwhile to God, and we can't understand God without His eyes and ears. So. Let's uh, approach the throne of grace and ask for the work of the Spirit in the study this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day that you've given us, this moment of freedom that we can assemble together, um, a, few, a few live and hopefully many online, and we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, uh, bless this humble assembly and uh, uh, that your spirit would be with us as we turn to your word this morning. Heavenly Father, we know that uh, we, we have to have his eyes and ears to understand what you said in your word and not to uh, interpose our own will or our agenda in what's going on. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that God the Holy Spirit would guide us to that end this morning as we study and uh, we pray for, we pray that all that we may learn will edify this local body and glorify our Lord and Savior. For it's in his name that we pray, sir. Amen. Well, we're continuing our study in 1 Timothy this morning. Uh, if you'll turn to 1 Timothy 1, 18, we're going to take a run and start at it. We just have a couple of more verses left here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, and we're going to I'm sorry, but we get a little repetition here as we uh, run across some concepts we've seen before and uh, uh, hopefully clear up some uh, um, uh, common misconceptions about uh, 1 Timothy 1.20. We're going to pick it up in 18, as I said, though. Uh, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you might fight the good fight. And we noted uh, 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 1 Timothy uh, 4, uh, 14 is what he's talking about there. He's referring to Timothy's ordination when they all laid hands on him and, and uh, uh, dedicated his life and work to uh, 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 glorifying God and, and teaching the word of God. And uh, uh, so they have uh, said in advance that God is going to use Timothy when they ordained him. And it's a good fight to, to teach the Word of God. As we saw uh, right off the bat in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is writing to help him uh, 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 combat uh, or fight the uh, 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 heresies that are going around in Ephesus at the time, one of those being Gnosticism, a mixture of uh, philosophy and mythology and, and the Word of God to uh, come to... Uh, uh, usually heretical understanding of, of God's word and, and the path that God wants us to, to walk in life. And uh, the other being uh, 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 Judaizers who are coming, uh, Jews who are coming in and telling the new believers that they have to live like Jews. They have to get circumcised. They have to follow uh, uh, the, the Torah's uh, eating guidelines and living guidelines and do everything like a Jew if they want to be a Christian. And uh, so these are the, the two main things that Paul will be fighting throughout uh, the, the book of Timothy. And also, uh, uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, these are the pastoral epistles, uh, not because they're written to pastors, uh, and they have in them most of the, the uh, ideas that we have to govern the local church uh, in this day and age, in the church age. And some of them have been misconstrued and some of them have been uh, 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 turned into systems of works rather than just the, uh, way to, the, the way to glorify God through the expression of Christ's love in the power of the Spirit. Uh, but that's the upshot of everything that we'll look at right there. So uh, he wants uh, Timothy to continue fight the good fight and teach the, the uh, way of faith and grace uh, God's grace and your faith to uh, live a life according to God's will. Uh, keep 19, keeping faith and good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. 
Well, uh, we're, we're changing analogies here in this verse. We've been talking a lot about walk in the last uh, month or so. And uh, uh, just as when we walk and travel, we would put one foot in front of the other, often uh, 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 navel um, uh, analogies are used. And because a, a ship moves in a, a, in a direction for a specific purpose, for a specific destination, and, uh, uh, and it has uh, uh, rudders and sails and, and working parts to help it get there. So it's often used as, as a, a, an analogy for the Christian way of life by Paul, as well as walking or traveling on, on land. So here we have a shipwreck. They've gone off path and they have uh, done so disastrously and crashed upon the rocks. So they're going, they're going down instead of continuing on in, in, in the Christian path. So some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. We saw, and we've noticed keeping faith, how do we fight a good fight? Keep faith and a good conscience. And we saw that phrase, good conscience, at the beginning of uh, 1 Timothy chapter one. And uh, a good conscience, we'll be talking a little bit more about the next class, but this is, this is when we are, are living our life knowing that we are, are forgiven of our sins. We were, for, we were forgiven the penalty of our sins by the work of, of uh, Christ on the cross, and that's what saved us and brought us into this plan. And often, though, we continue to sin as we grow in the Word and we, we try to do better, but uh, uh, we have to learn to walk in, in the Spirit to overcome those sins in our life. So we'll continue to sin even though we've been saved from that penalty of sin. And it's the process of God the Holy Spirit to redeem us from the power of sin in our lives. And we can have a good conscience and not be weighed down by the power of sin in our lives um, by remembering what Christ has done for us and realizing that God the Holy Spirit has the power over that sin. And as I touched on last week in the second class, I believe, you know, we have that cycle of faith of, of, of our salvation. God gave us, convicted us of our sinfulness and gave us the good news that his son has paid for the penalty that we could not pay so that we could have a relationship with Christ. And we believed that information. That's all we had to do. God convicted us and of our sin and revealed that supernatural information that he had sent his son to, to suffer the penalty of our sin. We believed that. And when we believe that, it has a result, an immediate result, that we are saved once and for all, forever, because uh, uh, the the work is all in in the in Christ's work, and none of our own effort. We simply believed that He did that for us, and so we're saved for eternal more. There's an immediate result of our faith when we believed in Christ, and and it glorifies God that He has saved us, that He has sent His Son, that the eternal God became man so that he could bear the penalty of our sins. And uh, this is the cycle of, of faith. God gives us that information. We believe it. It has a result, and it glorifies God. And that's exactly what we want to see in our lives as we live our lives as Christians. God is going to give us information from his word and tell us what he, he, what he expects of us. And we've got to believe that God is... is is right that God has the our best in mind and often doesn't seem that way because we like our sin and we enjoy doing it often right we've got to lay aside our lust for our desires for that sin and believe that God has our best interest in heart and that we're going to be happy and and content without that that fun sin in our life whatever it may be and we'll be looking closer at some of those sins in the next class as well so uh, we have that cycle of faith. We believe God's word and what he has told us. And it's not easy. We have to believe that. And because we believe it, it's got to have an effect in our lives. Now, we're not going to get the credit for doing this. Okay? You've got to realize this is the same pattern that we were saved by. We believe that God was right when he gave us that, and we appeal to God, the Holy Spirit, to have the power to overcome that. And we expect to see that overcome in our lives. 
And that's going to glorify God. That God the Holy Spirit gave us the ability to, to not do that sin or, and, and eventually not even want to do that sin if, if we continue in the sanctification process. So uh, the Word of God is designed to change our lives. It's designed to conform us to the will and work of God. And as we believe His Word and, and apply it in our lives, we're benefited by it and God is glorified by it, just like in our salvation. And there are two things that Satan can do to stop you from, from, from completing that cycle. One, he can make you think that you're so good that you don't need God's grace, that you can do it yourself, that you can overcome that sin if you're a believer, or that you can present yourself as righteous before God because of, of some beguiling justification system in your life. Well, uh, uh, we can't do, we, we never are gonna be good enough to, to put our works up there and say, hey, God, give me an amen on this. No, God doesn't give us an amen. We give him one, okay? And uh, the other way that God, that Satan beguiles us and, and breaks this cycle of faith is that he tells us we aren't good enough. Either we think we're so good we don't need God's grace or we think that we're so bad that we don't deserve God's grace. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. God's whole plan is designed because we are so bad. And uh, none of us are worse off than the rest of us. We all have negative righteousness and the inability to please God, right? So uh, those are the only two things ultimately that Satan can do to break this, this cycle of faith that we look for, that we see in salvation and we look for in our lives. We've got to remember that God has the power to, to do what we cannot. And we're never so far gone that, that God won't take us back, okay? And uh, no matter how, how mired in sin your life may become or a situation because of sin, God can still redeem that time, get it back and, and use it for his glory if you'll just keep faith and a good conscience. Remember that Christ has paid for it. You, you don't have to feel guilty because of your sin, but you should have a change because of your acknowledgement of that sin, that you see that sin in your life, that God has taught you that action, that activity is, is, is a sin. And uh, like I said, we'll be looking closer at some things considered sin, but the upshot here, uh, I'm going to give away the next class, but anything that is not of faith is sin, Paul teaches us. And, and the fact of the matter is, we uh, uh, have an activity, some activity in life, and uh, you know, God can use any activity to glorify him if that's, that's the plan. You know, uh, an analogy, I guess a gross analogy we could use is a, 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 a Jewish woman is told by a, a German officer in World War II that if uh, she sleeps with him, he's going to uh, 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 not kill off her family, right? And so she acquiesces and sleeps with him. Well, sleeping with him outside of, out of, outside of marriage, that's sin. That's defined as sin in, in the Word of God. And we'll be looking at why. But uh, uh, that would be a sin, right? Well, she's not sinning. She's, she's acting in love to save her family. And even though he has put her in a sinful position, that's on him, that's not on her, okay? God is not gonna hold her responsible for that sin of, of uh, adultery or fornication or whatever it may be because she didn't make a volitional decision to sin, she made a volitional decision to save her family, okay? So she acted in love. So. God would not call that sin. God would not hold that against her as sin. Christ didn't have to die for that, even though by the standard, hey, she, she, she's an adulteress or she's a, a, a prostitute. By the standard, as man looks at it, she sinned. But because she did something in love to save her family, she did not sin, okay? And uh, 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 that's going to be the, the, the dividing line as to whether or not God the Holy Spirit is at work in the situation. And, uh, but we, those are rare situations. Generally, we're cut and dry on this is adultery, don't do that. You know, and uh, uh, we're going to have to uh, apply that knowledge even though 
the situation may be that you think you can get away with it and you want to really bad. You've got to realize that God is, is, has given you a mandate for your own good and you have to have the faith to avoid that situation and not sin in that particular instance. So uh, that's, that's how we keep a good conscience, knowing that we're in, in God's plan, that we're acting in love. We see those fruits of the Spirit in our actions, and we can have a clear conscience no matter what, what the outcome, what, what the, the situation is, a clear conscience knowing that we can, we can still have our relationship with God because of Christ's work and because of the power of the Spirit. So uh, uh, keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected. They rejected faith, they substituted works, and they rejected a good conscience because a person under law is always has always got that nagging feeling deep down inside that they have missed us missed something along the way right they don't have an idea of grace so they have an idea of condemnation deep down all the time and so they do they have usually any system of works is going to have some cleansing ritual involved in it so that they can relieve their bad conscience from time to time uh, let's see. So uh, a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered over to Satan so that they might may be taught not to blaspheme. Wow. I'm an ordained minister, and uh, 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 I, I wasn't told when I got ordained that I had a special power. I don't remember passing that on to you, Brian, in your ordination ceremony, that uh, I can uh, 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 turn somebody over to Satan for, for the condemnation of their flesh so that they might learn better, taught not to blaspheme. And the blasphemy is that they are saying that, that God, God's word is wrong or God's word is distorted in some way so that their system of, of knowledge, in this case of Gnosticism, they have some special knowledge that, that makes them in charge of, of the, the teaching or because they are righteous by their legalistic standard. Either of those would be blasphemy, okay? So uh, he turns them over to Satan so that they can be taught not to blaspheme. Well, I'm going to uh, ask you to turn over in your Bible to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, and we're going to look at what we mean by blaspheme here and uh, what exactly is going on with this uh, turn, turn them over to Satan idea, okay? Uh, chapter 5 says it is actually reported, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you. An immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. These are the incestuous believers in the church in Corinth. And uh, uh, Paul starts off by saying, this, his, it, it, you've got to sympathize with his incredulous statement here. Even an unbeliever knows that this isn't right. There isn't a society in, 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 in anthropology, not even from a biblical perspective, where incestuous behavior is considered okay, all right? And uh, uh, it's, it's something that, that seems to be almost hardwired in us. And, and we see this kind of, of, of hardened heart rejection of absolute natural statements all the time these days that I was uh, uh, born a, a man but I'm really a woman God made a mistake or that I was born a woman and I should be a man these this kind of it it's absolutely no different from uh, the idea that a, 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 a mother and a father would or a, a mother and a son would have a, a relationship uh, even uh, Antigone in the ancient Greek world is uh, uh, the Greek tragedy where uh, a guy was separated from his family uh, at a very young age, and he uh, comes back to that city when he's an adult, and he doesn't know that his mother and his father are his mother and father, and, and he uh, gets in a fight and kills his father, 
and ends up marrying his mother. And when he found out, when he finally realized the truth, he he he, he blinded himself. He would he was so distraught that he had committed this sin before God and man that he uh, uh, blinded himself and and his daughter Antigone led him around uh, in the rest of his life in their tragic adventures. Uh, so uh, uh, a, a great trilogy if you like that sort of thing. But uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, idea is that even in an ancient Greek setting, they understood that incest is inherently evil, inherently wrong before before man and God. And uh, so uh, moral or morality of such a kind does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife and that you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead in order that one who has done this deed might be removed from your midst, okay? Why did they become arrogant? How have they become arrogant? Well, um, these people were not just sneaking around and having a, an incestuous uh, 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 relationship on the side that some or none knew about. They were walking down the, down the aisle at the church saying, we love each other, and this is right because it's love. You know, they have they have that attitude that they're sin, they're in sin, and they're telling everybody that they're right in their sin. Okay, this is where we get into blasphemy, when iniquity, when we're telling telling God that His rules are not correct, that our idea is is justified by our work system, and and you see a lot of abuse when we say that okay, you know that you are in the plan of God when you demonstrate Christ's love. And they take that and twist it and say, well, this is love. We love one another. And that's what Jesus wants for us because he loved us, you know. And, uh, and so they, they're going to uh, try and justify their sin before everyone and say that they're okay in, in, in what they are doing. And the arrogance, the puffed up, is that these, these believers in Corinth are allowing this. They're saying, okay, they must be right because it's love. They're in love and they're, they're such a lovely couple, et cetera, et cetera. It, that it must be okay. And, the, and they're, they're allowing this blatant uh, uh, denial of, of nature and God to go on in the midst of their church. And he tells them that uh, you, you should be mourning about this. You should be sad that this is, is happening in, in your midst and that uh, uh, these people have been beguiled. If they, are, if they are believers and they're in our church and they have been beguiled into this, we should be sad about it. We should be mourning that we've had a loss of a brother and sister in our midst and uh, uh, that, that we should give them a chance to, to repent and say that they are wrong before God. And perhaps then we could re even restore them to the, you know, let them in the church at that point. But instead, they've they've uh, uh, tacitly approved it by allowing them to continue to pray it parade around. And uh, so they've become puffed up and arrogant instead of mourning about it, in order that one who had done this deed might be removed from your midst. There's his cure. Tell them, if you aren't going to change your mind, you're going to have to leave our congregation. When we uh, leave a congregation, we are put out into the devil's world, okay? And when you walk in the devil's world according to the devil's rules, you've got some suffering coming your way. You may think that you found the magic cure to life and that uh, uh, your sin is going to make you happy, but you're going to end up in, in a horrible, horrible state because that's the way Satan's world always works, that you have temporary uh, uh, gratification, but in the long run, you're going you're gonna to have horrors in your life as a result of it. Uh, let's see. Um, Remove from your midst. So he's telling them, put them out into the devil's world. And... Um, When we do, when we throw them out of the church, we put them in the devil's world. Then, 
we've turned them over to Satan. Okay, and that's exactly what Paul is talking about to Timothy in Timothy chapter one when he tells them he has decided to turn them over to Satan. He's just saying, throw them out of the church. Okay, let them go out into the devil's world and, and sell that stuff. So uh, for I, on my part, though absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. We hope that that uh, uh, things things will go so that when they suffer the the ravages of sin in their life, the destruction of their flesh, then they are going to hopefully come back to the Word of God. Remember, God wants to, has already provided salvation for everyone, everyone, no matter what their sin. And even though we should have a horrible sin in our life, even one as blasphemous and, and uh, uh, heinous as, as incest, God still wants a relationship with you. He still wants you to come back to him in faith and, and let the spirit work to heal your soul that you have, have uh, put down this horrible path. So, uh, destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? It only takes a, 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 a few, few little uh, grains of yeast to make a, a, bre a bread dough rise, okay? And if you... Uh, have one grain of re yeast laying on your uh, counter and you're mixing up some uh, dough for a flatbread that you don't want to rise, it's not going to take much more than that one little bit of leaven to, to spread through the whole thing and make that, make that dough rise when you didn't want it to, okay? And that's, what, that's the analogy here of sin. It only takes a little bit of sin, like this one couple, and the whole congregation now is in their tacit approval of it are sinning are out of fellowship and 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 believing something that god does not say so their sin has spread to the whole loaf to the whole church here and and uh just because they they would not say uh that's that's wrong before God. That's not the love Jesus has us wants us to demonstrate. And you guys need to change change this situation or get out of our church. Uh, uh, clean out the old leaven that you may that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover also has been sacrificed as a part of of. Uh, uh, Passover, they take all the they would take they were told to take get all the leaven out of their house, and uh, uh, even till today they have like an Easter egg hunt with the children. They take a little package of, of of yeast tied up with a bow and they hide them around in the house, and the children go and find the the, the little packages of of yeast so that they could get all the leaven out of the house for the Passover celebration. Still do that to this day, and. Uh, 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 that's why he brings up Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed and once again this is the basis of our clear conscience right that Christ has been sacrificed our sins have been paid for uh, let us therefore celebrate the feast not with the old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth okay. um I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not mean with the immoral people of, I did not mean at all, I did not at all mean with the immoral, pe immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or the idolaters, for then you would have to go out, out of, the, uh, of the world. Okay. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not to even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? 
But for those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So we, we see our idea of judging one another here. And, it, and he's saying, you don't judge the people outside of your church. You don't, it's not your job. People outside of our church, we're going to give them the gospel and tell them how God has, is, has judged them by his own standard and through the work of his son. And if they're in, but if they're inside our body and they want to call sin righteousness, it is our duty to judge them and hopefully help them to repent and change that state of mind. And if they won't, it's our duty to get them out from our midst so that they don't spread that sinfulness around in the church. Even if we stay in a, if we leave them here and say, okay, we'll let you stay, but we don't condone your behavior and condemn them, judge them for it, but don't put them out. You're going to have people in the church judging them being put out of the spirit. They're going to be, and you're going to have people following what they say. And you're going to have contention and schisms and all these things. It's better that we would judge those within our midst who are in iniquity like this, saying that wrong is right and right is wrong, and put them out. For those outside of the church, we're going to, we're going to evangelize them. That, we're not going to judge them for that behavior. Okay? So this is our idea of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, but those who are outside, God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. That's turning them over to Satan, putting them in outside into the devil's world. And the devil's world is going to uh, punish them. Okay, uh, When you're turned over to Satan, Satan doesn't have God's uh, uh, graciousness and he's going and the, your sin is going to destroy you. If you, if you remain in it outside of the church. Okay, so that's our, our concept there of, of turning uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander over to uh, uh, Satan, which was a great relief to me in study because I did not want the power to do that. <laughs> so let's go back to 1 Timothy, and uh, uh, we finally have wrapped up 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to begin here in uh, chapter 2, where uh, uh, we start with the pastoral instructions in chapter two, okay? Um, that's part of our, if, if you have the outline from when we began this and we've outlined the whole book. So here we are in uh, uh, pastoral uh, uh, instructions. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We are, to, we, this is how we, we are to address the outside world, okay? We have things going on inside our church. This is our space before God. And, um, uh, uh, but we are to uh, uh, pray for, Entreaty, beg God for something. Petitions, ask something for someone else. Uh, and give thanks on behalf of all men, okay? Not just those inside of our church. We pray, we should be in prayer for our government that uh, uh, God would, would guide them and, and, and reveal to, him, to them his will each and every day. Uh, our prayer is... Uh, um, that we would remain one nation under God, right? And that God would, the Holy Spirit, spirit of revival would bring more and more people in our country uh, back to the table, back to the church, back to a relationship with God so that God can use us to spread his gospel across the world as he has done in the past. And uh, uh, it's, it's, I've often said that because of that, that it's the work of God, the Holy Spirit, in convicting and leading people into a Christian life that is, it, it, it is the salvation of our country. Even though there's not a political, a, a, a political solution, we're told to pray for our politicians, our leaders, that they would have the wisdom or that God would lead them in some way to make wise decisions. 
And the decisions that we want them to make are decisions for those divine institutions we looked at last week, for for uh, family and for marriage and uh, uh, and for national sovereignty. Okay, these are things that we want our 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 politicians to keep our nation in. And the result of of, of our politicians, they don't even have to be believers in Christ if they got the understanding that that uh, marriage is a sacred thing, that uh, uh, families should be allowed to function together and, and without the influence of government in their own volition, and that we should have freedom and volition to choose in our, in our own country. If, we, if our politicians will just make sure those things remain established, then we're gonna have a, a, a quiet, dignified life. We're not going to be in. We're not going to be pursued and, and uh, torn down by the outside world. So uh, uh, we're supposed to be praying for those things on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all goodly, godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, that's what God desires all men to be saved. Okay, we're all going to be saved because God wants it, right? He's God. He can do anything he wants. He wants this. We're all going to be saved. That's the misapplication of this verse you hear all the time. You hear it these days more, more than, than the correct one, I assure you. It may be God's desire of course, it's his desire that all may, men may be saved. That's why he sent his son to die on a cross for all mankind, not just the ones who believe. He set up a volitional choice for us to choose the right tree, right? Adam and Eve chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're supposed to be choosing the tree of life that cross of, that Christ hung on so that we can have an eternal and uh, uh, relationship with, with God through that work. And uh, it's, that's why God provided it for man, mankind and womankind universally is because we, uh, uh, he desires that we would all believe. God wants a relationship with his creation. We see this in the garden, in the Garden of Eden. He, he created the garden, he created the earth, the heavens and the earth and all the things on it. And then he created man and woman and he placed them in that garden. And he didn't just let them go. He came and visited every evening. In the cool of the evening, Jesus Christ showed up and, 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 and they worshiped him and talked to him and, and had a relationship with him. That's what creation is for, that they can have a relationship with God. And that's what God continues to desire. That's why he made us, that's what he wants, right? And, he, and so we fell and he provided a way that all of us can come back to him through the work of Christ. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's taken away volition, right? We fell because God gave us volition and Adam chose that, that the tree of good and evil, right? He made a volitional decision. That was the, that was the basis of the fall. And we all, and we all are, are going to continue to have that volitional decision. It's no glory to God if he creates a being that can only worship him, right? It's, it's that, that key element of a volitional decision that we, we choose to have a relationship with our Father and recognize his graciousness and love for us. That's the glorification of God, not simply that we were made to worship him, right? So uh, he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, come to the knowledge of the truth, not... That's and that not come to the knowledge of our truth of that truth, recognize that, that truth. That's that's volition stated clearly in a passage that is often used to say God is going to save us all, no matter what, right? So, um, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man. Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony, the witness given 
in its own, in the proper time, in the fullness of time. This is the work of, of, of God to bring us back to him, that he, that his, that God became man at just the right time in history to provide us with the salvation, that restoration of relationship with, with God, that, that God created us for. Okay. There's only, there's only one God and, uh, He's a three-part, a, a triune God, not a three-part God, because all of them are one, right? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And uh, um, so he, there's just this one God and one man that, that did the work, and that's the God-man, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Messiah, Jesus, Christ Jesus. Uh, and he's the only one also between God and man, only one mediator. Buddha can't save you, and the Hindu gods can't save you, and the Greek gods couldn't save anyone, and the uh, uh, great white father in the sky couldn't save anybody. There isn't a god or a religious system ever made that is going to save man. There's one mediator, one man, the, the Messiah promised, Jesus, that has died for us and can take us back to restoration of fellowship with God. God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all and paid for our sins with this death. The testimony uh, uh, brought at the proper time. And for this I was appointed, verse 7, we're in 1 Timothy 2, 7, and for this I was appointed a, a preacher and an apostle uh, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. Uh, it's, it doesn't necessarily point to the first half of that sentence or the second half. I'm not lying that I was appointed as, a, as a, 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 an apostle. And I'm not lying that uh, uh, Gentiles have been called into this plan in faith and truth. Okay. He's not lying about either of uh, either of those facts. He's uh, 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 appointed as a pa as the uh, preacher and apostle uh, to the Gentiles. All the other apostles were uh, of the Gentiles and spoke to the Gentiles in the time of Christ, pointing to Christ as the 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 I mean uh, Jewish uh, uh, as the Jewish Messiah, the one who was promised to bring all to. Uh, uh, back into relationship with God the Father. Paul's job, the reason he was made an apostle, was so that he could tell the Jew Gentiles the same thing. Come to, to, come to the Father, uh, the truth of coming to the Father in faith, we could say. Right? Therefore, verse 8, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. You see uh, uh, believers in, in, fel in uh, uh, worship and fellowship even to this day and they, they you know, do the hand thing uh, as, they, as they sing or as they pray. Uh, a lot of times that's associated with uh, emotionalism in, in services, but there's nothing wrong with it. And this, this and one other verse are, are precisely where that idea comes from lifting up your holy hands, so that's why they're lifting their hands, okay? And uh, uh, as I said, there's, there's nothing wrong with a custom and practice like this, as long as we understand that it isn't, isn't uh, a work that we're doing for God. It's a, it should, as a, a, an emotional response, be just that, uh, 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 an expression of, of our acceptance. And this is something seen even in... Uh, uh, say uh, uh, Muslims, they pray like this. They hold their hands up like this. The guy, the 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 God, uh, God's uh, grace can fall down and they can catch it. You know, so uh, uh, it's not a a, 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 a a foreign concept to the rest of the world that you would raise your hands or lift your hands. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say that lifting holy hands is a, a, a Greek word is probably more doing it palms up than waving your arms, you know, like a touchdown. But uh, 
uh, it, it's fine either it's fine either way because it's just a custom and practice okay and and it's a symbol of of submission to God and uh, that's even the way that other religions see that that action so lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension all in agreement praying together no uh, uh, no uh, dissension or schism among us praying to God as one okay uh, Pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Verse 9, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold and pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as befits women making a claim to godliness. As a matter of fact, Clothe yourself in good works befits any man or woman making a claim to godliness, okay? And, and uh, he's just warning against uh, uh, dressing in a, a flashy manner to attract uh, uh, attention to your, your beauty or sexuality in, in, when you're supposed to be there to worship God, not to worship yourself. And, and we don't need to make a, a, a list of, of rules from this passage and say, okay, you're wearing pearls, get out of here. You know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a, a, that attitude of uh, uh, adorning yourself to bring attention to yourself rather than coming to, uh, to worship God. Don't worship yourself, worship God. And uh, if we, and like I said, Clothe yourself in in, in uh, 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 good works. Remember our good works, the things that we do to show that we are are doing the work of God is demonstrating God's love. So love God, not yourself. Uh, don't don't cause guys' heads to swivel as you walk to your seat in the, <laughs> in the general assembly, and. Uh, 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 and that's that's true for men as well as women, okay? Especially in this day and age. But uh, 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 we uh, come to, we come together to worship, to worship God and to praise Him, not to uh, to draw, draw attention to ourselves, okay? True for for men as well as women, I would say. Uh, let a uh, let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissive submissiveness. Submiss submitting to this command he's just laid down, okay? Submitting to dressing in a modest fashion, okay? He's not saying that all women are, sub are to submit wholly to all men. That's way wrong, okay? And, and leads to, is going to lead to more problems than it's going to lead to any kind of solution, I can tell you that. So uh, you, we do have, uh, and we'll be talking as we go on uh, in, this, in this book about the uh, uh, role of authority. We've already seen it in regard to government, right? Pray for those in, who are in authority over you. That's part of nationalism. You have government, you have police, you have order, for a greater good, right, within that organization. And the same is true in family. And there is a role of submissiveness for women within a family. But this isn't talking about women in the family, okay? This isn't saying all women are to submit to all men or that women are inferior to men in any way. It's saying here that we're uh, that uh, they should submit to this these instructions he's given, receive these the instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. So, I do not permit, he says. Is this just Paul's opinion? Would God put it in, in his word if it were just Paul's opinion without it saying, it's my opinion that women should be this way, okay? It's in the word of God for a specific purpose. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man in the church, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being quite deceived fell into transgression. But women shall be pre preserved 
through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint, with discretion. Okay. Now, um, we have here uh, uh, um, the place where women are given absolute authority. Okay. They have a purpose, they have an authority and they have a, a, a place for that authority and that's within the family. They have children and they uh, uh, raise those children in love and uh, 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 that's, their sal that's their salvation. Okay. That's, their, that's their means of, of uh, rem being in the plan of God is that they have a that family role and by dedicating themselves in that family role it's going to help them to stay out of trouble just like a, a, a men have the same same mandate we have a role to fulfill and if we fulfill God's plan in our life it's going to help keep us out of trouble okay for and the reason we see that Paul gives this statement man was created first and then Eve and it was not man who was deceived Okay, he sinned. He sinned just as hard as the woman did. He was not no better off in, in, in the fall because he, he sinned just as much as she did. But she was more, she was deceived. Satan didn't even try to play that stuff with Adam. He knew, he, he, he knew that he would have a shot with Eve if he went to deceive her and talk her into eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so, uh, uh, Paul doesn't just give his an, uh, opinion about the role of women in the local church here. He is telling them uh, why he tells, says that a woman should not be uh, in authority over a man, but to remain quiet during the service, okay? That doesn't mean they, have, they don't have a role in the church. And we're going to see that quite uh, laid out for us in, in chapter 3. There's a role for women in the church. They have a role even in teaching in some cases in the church. But they should not be the authority over the church because the word of God says they are more susceptible to deception and to follow some lie being told or, or, or misunderstanding about the word of God. And as any person in authority in a church, if, if I get deceived, and teach you something incorrect, then all of you are going to suffer mind it for my deception, okay? And not that I am without ability to be deceived. There are many pastors out there today, right now, teaching false, false gospels, okay? Teaching false ideas, teaching you something other than rely on God, the Holy Spirit, and it will bring about the good works in your life. And that's that's the whole the whole message of of the uh, Bible is rely on God and let him do the work, okay? So it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman. And uh, uh, so because of this apparent genetic uh, ability to be deceived greater than men, uh, they are not to be the authority figure and teach every uh, other people in the church, okay? Again, there are other roles for women. Women are not second-class citizens. They have a role just as they have a role in the family, they have a role within the local church, and we'll explore that closer as we get to uh, chapter three, okay? Well, uh, uh, since we are uh, uh, moving into a, a new area there, chapter three, we'll talk about, uh, um, uh, so I'm sorry, chapter two was just role of the woman and, and our position in government. The church, doc, the doctrines of church management are, part of God's overall plan, right? We've already seen that the church has, has a authority just like a nation has authority. For, for protection and leadership, we have government. And within our church, again, for protection and leadership, we have a pastor, okay? And within a family, again, for protection and leadership, we have, we have authority. Mom's the the believe me, I grew up with a single mother. I know the authority of a mother in the family, and uh, and she had to, uh, you know, like the Bible says, uh, Caesar does not have a sword for no purpose. Well, my mom didn't have a belt for no purpose. I guarantee you that. So uh, there is a, a authority in in a family, in a church, in a country, and it's the same pattern. God is so gracious; He doesn't make a convoluted system whereby 
one generation is supposed to do one thing and the next generation is supposed to do another. He doesn't make it where one part, part time in the world that you were supposed to be saved one way and another time in the history of the world we're supposed to be saved by another way. He doesn't say, okay, work this day, today and tomorrow you can be in grace. He has the exact same plan. And, and, and part of that plan is this system of, of authority in, in, in localized areas, right? Nation. Uh, 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 um, a church, a family, and your own per, uh, uh, volition is and, and, and to walk in the spirit is the authority and, and protection in your life. Okay, it's the same path, same plan. We just get it in, on a larger scale or drilled down to us personally. God is not the author of confusion. His plan is simple. It's simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Believe in the, in the power of his word, uh, of his spirit to help you follow his word. And you, by, you will glorify him. You will, be, you will have a benefit in your life and you will glorify him. Stick to that plan. Keep it simple and you'll have a lovely life no matter what happens. Let's close with a word of prayer and we'll assemble together again in about 15 minutes for our second class. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wisdom of, of your word, for the simplicity of your plan, for the beauty of your grace. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the work of your power in our lives. And we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will work in each and every one of the members of this church, each and everyone who hears this message, Lord. Let them know that your grace is overwhelming. Your love has provided all through the work of your son and the, and the power of your spirit. We ask that you be glorified in our lives for it's in Christ's name we pray, sir. Amen. Amen.